Where are you? <laughs> I am on vacation, allegedly. <laughs> is that um, your new mate? <laughs> no, <laughs> this point? is just... Uh, look, I'm in a rental house. Like, there's a bar that has things in it. And uh, when you're on vacation, you have to then come up with a set to record the Carmudgeon Show on. And, and this so is the plant set. is like... Well, it was just there. Right? I mean, I didn't kind of notice it until all of a sudden... You I should water it. It doesn't have a... Th- it just would go... Th- it's <laughs> also <laughs> fake. Yeah. Um, hi there. Welcome to this episode of the Carmudgeon Show, live or previously recorded from somewhere that <laughs> so is So the not opposite of live... <laughs> Yeah. Live or dead. <laughs> dead yes. from my, uh, my couple days in Palm Springs. Mm. Um, is it hotter than the sun? It is three degrees hotter than the sun. Actually, it's 100 degrees. And it, when you're in the desert, as they say, it's a dry heat. It's not bad. It's really not bad. It was like 100 degrees. Um, I have been writing scripts for upcoming video productions. And I'm doing oh. so near the pool, which is no Sounds different than Sounds very being, difficult. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the pool right now. I'm not in it. I haven't really ever been in it this whole week. But, you know, I think it's better off. I'm better off. Are you off. waiting for it to be warmer than the sun? Like a no. lot warmer than the sun no, before waiting, you go in? No, I'm waiting for the, for the uh, scripts to be written. <laughs> because, uh. frankly, I would rather go home without a suntan and being waterlogged uh, than go home, pick up my director who's flying in as I arrive home, and then have him be like, hey, so what are we recording? And I can be like, I don't know. What are know. you recording? Are you allowed to divulge that information, or is that a need-to-know basis? Uh, well, since everyone's going to find out eventually anyway, because it was public. So in, I think I've mentioned this in, in the past, so obviously we know that I've joined Haggerty, um, and I have spent the last couple of months toiling in obscurity. Um, I did get a phone call one day, like, hey, what are you doing for Haggerty? And I'm like, at the moment, I'm installing a toilet seat. <laughs> There were three of those calls. One was I'm installing a toilet seat, one was I'm painting, and one was I'm uh, uh, hanging blinds. Um, and this is what I'm doing at Haggerty. No, uh, I am <laughs> building a studio. Uh, I'm calling it Haggerty Studio West because that sounds like fun until I come up with some like profane better name that like has some double entendre that's funny. Um, and, uh, and so I'm doing this because at Isimi we use the back of the warehouse for the, for the spotlight show. Um, and it worked. We moved a couple of cars out of the way, and that's all we were able to do. But we were under a spotlight, which got, that's where we came up with the name of the spotlight. For the spotlight mm. show. Um, it was a skylight. And so now that I'm not able to just tell everyone at ECME, move your crap out of the way and, and let me film here, um, I have to build a studio. Um, and so I'm going to be doing um, basically the same shows that I was doing at ECME because, frankly, they worked. I think. I, so I like what's anyway. the first victim? What's the first episode? So there, there are three shows. So there's a text planner show, which uh, was previously called Proper Care and Feeding, which I've come up with a funny name that I'm not ready to talk about yet because it's not <laughs> been approved. And then I came up with profane names for the next two shows, which are the Spotlight Show and the Icon Show. I'm, I'm ba- like I said, I'm basically doing the same, the same mix, but I'm doing a lot of them. Um, and the names are not yet approved by, by legal <laughs> So, um, oh God, <laughs> that's never a good sign. I'm working on calling my show something, but legal is horrified and they're working on it. Um, so uh, this first batch that we're going to do is uh, a bunch of sort of proper care and feeding, which is the tech show. Um, mm-hmm. And then the, f- the first of the new, new we'll call it New Spotlight. Um, and that is on a very red car with mid-engine, rear-wheel drive, manual transmission, crazy performance, big Gandini box flared fenders, um, and completely no usability. So you get to guess what it is. Gandini. Red. So it's not a Ferrari. Correct. Because it's done by Gandini. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gandini takes credit for it. Although I've read other places that he had nothing to do with it really. Box so I, flares. Uh-huh. I mean, so Martello Gandini, obviously, Countach. Stratos, yeah, Mura. Mira. Although I think that was probably more Jajaro, but you know, we can, there are, they let them all fight, fight that out. But I mean, you know, Gandini does the stupidest cars of all time. Like, they're always bizarre and weird and amazing. 308 GT4. Mm-hmm. What? Mid engined. Yep. Mid engine, five speed manual transmission, rear wheel drive. I'll give you another. another Is hand. it naturally aspirated or turbocharged? Turbocharged. Early and intercooled. 
And we're talking very late 1970s here. So that's, I mean, Porsche 911 Turbo introduced the intercooler to the production car in 1976. Per my research, ah. 1977 per yours. Um, so somewhere there. 78. 78 model year. 78 okay. model year was the first year of the intercooled turbo. Why do I even bother arguing with you? Yes, you're right, I'm sure. Okay. Somebody look uh, it up and prove hyphen wrong. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to. What country is it from? La France. C'est de la France. Oh, uh, 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 the Sank. Renault Sank. Turbo. Renault Sank Turbo 2. Uh, yeah. Renault 5. R5 Turbo 2. Yeah. Um, cool. I thought that was a really cool way to start the whole series. Like, okay, we want something fun and we want something cool and we want something that looks great against the black background that we painted in the studio and it's red. Um, and it's just wow. batshit. The car is, I haven't, I haven't even driven it yet. So like I have the script written with all the facts and whatever and then I have the big sort of section of like insert all the good shit here that you don't know yet. Um, I really mm. can't wait. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, I've never driven one. I imagine okay. it is an experience. Uh, I mean, here's the thing. It's a, this is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm giving away part of the whole s- script, but like here's, here's the thing about this car. That w- Should I give it away? Should I torture people? Here, it's taking, I'm not going to give it away, but I'm going to say that it is taking a perfectly usable, space-efficient hatchback and ruining everything good about it. Because yes. Renault literally took the engine out of the front and threw it in the back where the back seats and the cargo hold would go. Um, and then basically put nothing back in the front, like made, made the front no more usable than it had ever been. Um, and yes, it's got like back. a sort of like the front of an NSX where there's just a bunch of mechanical sort of components that aren't sealed from the, the environment. Yeah, and there's a spare tire in there, so I think. Yeah. Uh, so basically yeah, you like take out a whole engine NSX. and an, an entire powertrain and replace it with a spare tire and like, oh, we're out of room. Tough. <laughs> Um, I always thought that that was baffling about the NSX. It's very un-Japanese when you open up the front and you're like, there's the spare tire and you take out the spare tire and you're like, oh, there's the ground. It's so (laughs) un-Japanese. It's very un-Japanese. But yeah, I mean, but tires don't need to be protected from the ground. No, no, they don't. It's just odd that they wouldn't like come up with just some hyper-efficient, thoughtful solution that makes the car even more usable than it already is. A folding spare tire that just folds into like... Some compartment that somehow manages to swallow like an entire cubic meter of toilet paper from Costco, even though the space is smaller than a cubic meter. Well, you just described the Honda Fit, right? I mean, the Honda Fit, which could swallow an entire Chevy Suburban, even though itself (laughs) (laughs) is smaller than the engine in a suburban together with a motorcycle yes. and a hot tub and a ooh, hot tub yeah hot tub. it's perfect for 100 degree weather one right out there that I'm going to go see you later bye no. um, so yeah so first episode is going to be Renault R5 Turbo 2 yeah, so um, you're doing some homologation material I did some homologation material this week also actually um, day before yesterday did you do that 911 thing yes the Cura RS it's another Here's another I goddamn find. Porsche. Another yes, goddamn I know. Porsche. Another flattened know. Volkswagen Beetle. What is this one? An, a Carrera a, RS. Carrera RS. This so this is, is the 27 RS. Yes. Um, that it's is very cool. Tell me how very cool it is. Because they're all 911s. They're very cool. This is hyphen we're talking to. They're okay. Amazing. Um, perhaps one of the most interesting things about this car is that it owes its existence to the 917. Uh, were it not for the 917, the R- Carrera RS would not exist. Okay. Um, it's also a homologation car. It also, um, the first time they went racing in, when, in the car, it was going to race against prototypes, and it was a street car, so it ran in GT, which is like the street car based class. So they, it's a slower group of cars that runs at the same time in racing uh, at the Daytona 24 Hours in 73. And when they went out, the, the FIA was like, oh, shit, we don't have homologation papers for you, so you can't run as a GT car. So they had to run it as a prototype. Uh, and not only did it beat all the GT cars, it beat all the, the prototypes, and it won Daytona overall uh, in a 24-hour race and its first outing. Okay. That, I mean, might make it, that's kind of almost pretty cool. And <laughs> it, Even I have um, to admit. <laughs> it also, it, like the driving experience is really what it's about. Like, all of it is immaterial once you drive it, and then you're just like, holy fuck. Like, the, it's just spectacular to drive. Did you, what did you just say? Uh, pardon my French? No, I'm doing the French car. You just, I think, hyphen just dropped a holy fuck in the middle of a li- uh, live dead podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, 
it's very good to drive. It was one of those cars where when I got it, I was like, oh my God. Like, cool. I can't believe I just did that to a car, let alone someone else's car. Oh, oh can like, you drop it, it off just... at my house when you're done with it? <laughs> <laughs> I've already taken it home, fortunately. Thank God. Because if I owned that car for any amount of time, I'm fairly sure that a variety of illegal or bodily harm related things would happen. Like, it just is magnificent to drive. Hmm. Well, I look and it's one of those cars where you're just like, oh, God, it's another Porsche. And then you drive and you're like, I don't care. <laughs> don't care about any of that. But don't you feel that way about every Porsche? Isn't that like your, your shtick? That's what you do? Um, like, I mean, I, I like them, but it, I like them just when I'm driving them. Like, it's, there's no, you don't go to Cars and Coffee in them. Like, it's stupid for that mission. Like, everybody is familiar with the shape. It's just, it makes no sense until you're driving just absolutely flat out. And then you're just like, holy moly. Like, this is I get what so a car many be. comments, but like so many DMs from people who are like, I know you hate 911s, but dot, dot, dot. And I'm like, I, I might have gone a little bit far with the joke of me hating on all 911s because the reality is they all, it's, it's always, the, what I hate about them is that it's always the same thing. You can't criticize them because <laughs> they're too good. And every time I drive a 911, I'm like, I don't really want to fucking, oh my God, I don't care. It's amazing. But it's not exactly even, like, good. Like, there's a lot of things about it where you're like, objectively, this is bad, but somehow it all works. I don't... I, uh, this, that's an interesting thing for me to hear you say, because other than the 992's horrendous interior rattles and the 996's horrendous interior materials, I don't think I've ever... And exterior styling. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, so, excuse me. But yeah, other than that, I don't, I don't, like, I've never thought about anything bad. Tell me what was bad about it. Okay, so, like, if you are approaching this car and you say, okay, engineers, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take all of the weight and we're going to put it behind the rear axle where it has no business being. And then the weight distribution is going to be, like, 12% in the front and 88% <laughs> in the back. It's going to be amazing, guys. And, uh, like, of course not. Like, that sounds like a terrible idea. Yeah. Uh, it, but it always, I don't know, look. I, they I always prefer... make it work, which is the beauty of the car, but it shouldn't. Yeah. Objectively, like if you were to say, design the ideal sports car, like how would you package it? Uh, what would the weight distribution be? Uh, it, this honestly, would not be the it, answer. It would be not. It would, it, but it would. I mean, that's the thing is only the Germans could make it work. I mean, I sincerely doubt I could get into rear engine Tatra and, and suddenly decide it's the dynamic. Well, let's visit the Corvair. How, how about that? I mean. Yeah, but I mean, the 911, I actually really prefer, genuinely prefer 911's handling characteristics and limit behavior to just about every other uh, sports car. And the reason why is I, I think I, I'm, I may be in the minority here and I may be just flat out wrong, but to me, a sports car is about the experience and like I want to, I want to work. I don't want the car to do anything for me. And I, like, when I first got in my first 911 on track. Ah, um, okay, it was my turn to drop the phone. <laughs> we're even. <laughs> Hold on. Let Standing me let me secure while... some additional additional scotch tape. Well, see, this is the joke: is that I went on vacation and brought gaff tape with me, so I win oh. the preparedness award over Hyphen, who's using scotch tape. However, while you're fixing your phone, I will admit that I left my water all over there. So I'm gonna leave scene for a second and get my. Oh water my so god! This is just everything's coming apart at the seams. We are a complete disaster today. Um, all right, so uh, while you fix your phone. Wait, I've muted you. Oh, God. Okay. God, I'm so bad at this. You, now you're not. I, fuck you. <laughs> I'm going to tape this. You just tape over the camera. Just be like. Um, uh, my first time ever in 911 on track, I did not. Uh, I, I didn't quite realize that. Like front engine cars. front Like I had been. My track car previously was a Golf. And, you know, it had like one. The, the instruction manual for how to manage this car at the limit was basically like, keep the, was one line, keep the front wheels pointed where you want to go and just be moderate on the gas. And it would do whatever you want. Like just never, that, that rule fixed everything. And rear wheel drive cars have a couple lines, like, you know, if you're overwhelming the rear tires, maybe back off a little bit or blah, blah, blah. And then you get to mid-engine cars, which have like, you know, maybe like a, a bullet, five bullet points of things you need to do to, main, to, to make this work. And then 911s, the guide to controlling a 911 was 12,000 pages over 62 volumes with 1,000 pages of illustrations and appendices, and I loved it. I loved the challenge of learning how to harness all of that weight behind me and then figuring out how to take that problem and turn it into an advantage. 
And yes. basically, 911s are the best tools to teach you to be the best driver you can. Because and what only... you get in exchange for all of that is you get this experience where it's like instead of driving in two dimensions, you get like three additional dimensions of driving. It's kind of like flying where you have like the up and down and it just adds this whole other layer. The, the ability to control the car, especially on the throttle and the ways that you can get the car to rotate that have nothing to do with steering is just like, holy moly, it it's blows amazing. the mind. Right. It's a, it's a whole, you're right in saying it's a whole different dimension. And unlike some ill handling cars, I mean, there are, there are cars that are monsters and are nightmares and are terrible um, to control. The 911 isn't that way. It doesn't want you dead. Um, it does what exactly what you ask. Unless you you're an idiot. It, well, if it, you ask if it you, to kill you, it will. Yes, um, correct. I apologize for the background noise, guys, if you guys, if, I don't know if you can hear it. Um, but it's the... <laughs> That'll it, be the least offensive... Uh, we're going to have to have the, t the dog, that we, we might have used the dog, the, the technical difficulties dog, oh. when I st stopped recording and then started again by mistake. Did you actually stop recording? Oh, you are going, you're like getting an F for this episode. <laughs> the, the editor's going to kill me. Yeah, well, it's not my problem. Um, <laughs> I don't even work for ECM anymore. <laughs> I don't have to listen to anyone complain. Um, but no, it's not like a 911 wants you dead. If you ask it to kill you, it will. If you, if you understand how to operate it, it becomes this tool that you've then mastered. And it's a dance. It's a beautiful dance. You're um, saying all this shit I'm going to say in my episode. Oh, listen. I said it first. And if you, if you steal this shit, I'm suing you. <laughs> <laughs> I... Um, yeah. So, anyway... Um, I'm glad you enjoyed the 911. I'm looking forward to your episode on it. Um, next time, drop it off at my house when you're done, especially if it's 2.7 I tried, hours, but you were on your way to Palm Springs. Yep. I was, unfortunately, going on non-vacation where I can sit at the pool and talk to you with you know, imported gaff tape uh, while you drop your phone at me. Um, but you know what did happen in the last week or so that is, has upset me and wanted, made me want to talk to you about? These two cars that we're talking about um, are, will be soon illegal. Um, the Cal California passed or is in the process of passing legislation to make the sale of all internal combustion engines illegal as of 2015. Yeah, these, to be clear though, these cars are not going to be illegal. Okay, this type of vehicle can no, no longer be sold new. Yes, yeah. will no longer be able to be sold new. Let, uh, but let's as be of, honest, what is it, 2035? 2035. Yeah. They will be illegal soon. I mean, everything, all of the legislation... And every, all of the restrictions and all of the emissions tests are all doing one thing, and they're gradually outlying internal combustion engines. And it's going to happen, right? I mean, it's going to happen at some point in our life, in maybe not our lifetimes, hopefully not that quickly, but there will be a point at which you are not permitted to, to run an internal combustion engine on a public road. It's, it's going to happen. It's already happened in Europe where they have different environment zones where you can't bring... Uh, certain pollution levels of cars into certain places, and it's... I, we live in San Francisco. I mean, I suspect in the next 15 years, there will start to be restrictions on what you can and cannot drive. Um, and the news about the 25, 2035 mandate hit the day that I was on a rally with you, um, and I was in a 718 Spider. Um, oh, you had many friendly things to say about that car, by I the way. I guess we talked about those yeah. last week. Um, but I was like, you know, on the back road thinking, this is what I'm going to miss. Like the, the sound and the experience and the clutch and the shifter and the, the whole thing is, is really what I'm going to miss. Um, and that was the first time. When, when the news launched, I'm like, eh, it's what, what needs to be. The environment is not going to tolerate our, us continuing to pollute the way we are. Um, we absolutely need to get past these cars. Um, and then I drove that spider and I'm like, fuck, I don't want to lose this. Um, and I think we should talk about this, given that yeah. we're the two old men and the Muppets on the side. I just, I, I don't know. I'm hoping that old cars can continue to ha occupy a place, but as a sort of peripheral thing, I think the mainstream world has no business driving around in internal combustion cars. We've talked about this before because it's like, why on earth would you ever buy a, a BMW 320i when you could buy a Tesla Model 3? I mean, there's just absolutely no comparison. If you try them back to back, you'll be like, in what world would anyone ever buy the BMW instead of the Tesla? Um, I love that you've become an EV convert with your ego. How's your ego? It's great, actually. I've been, uh, <laughs> I did so more, so a variety of in, uh, unintentional burnouts yesterday. Um, 
None of which you were upset about, I'm guessing. Like no, no. I mean, that. there's also this wonderful turn that I am just continually... Uh, never mind. I don't want to incriminate myself. Uh, I'm enjoying the car very much. <laughs> That's you the long and short You haven't even modified yours to turn off stability control yet. That's correct. And you're still having this much fun. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. I, guess, I guess there is a reason why Camisa did not speak in ego. People get so mad at me. Um, but yeah, I love that you've become an EV convert, convert, but you're right. It only takes a couple of minutes to realize that we as an, a society have found a better way. That's the best way I can put I just had a RAV, no, it wasn't the RAV4. It was a CRV as a press car. And it'll be one of my Insta reviews. It's sitting there waiting. Um, and, and Didn't I had you an do this one already? So there was something where you used the word mooing. Yeah, what that was, was that probably for? The, the, the CRV, because then I had an inside, and then I had, I just had this string of sort of hybrids. And so what's this other thing that's not the CRV? Uh, an insight, which insight. is a Civic hybrid, basically, that's okay, in its so own body. Um, all right. And I just, like, I'm like, wow, this thing gets 50-something miles per gallon EPA highway. I got 40-ish out of it, driving like a jerk, and... Um, but the thing is, the thing about gas powered cars is when you make them efficient, you make them slow. It's just kind of the way it works. Um, you, hmm. you don't have that with electric cars. And I realized to get 50 miles per gallon out of a gas powered car, you're just fucking miserable. Like you have this hybrid system on top of it and the battery died. Like I want, I went through the whole battery on the hybrid on that thing. And like, I tried to accelerate to 80 and it was 31 seconds, I think, to get to 80 up this slight hill. Um, and I just was like, we found a better way. Electricity is silent. Like, it doesn't matter how slow the e-golf is or how slow a Fiat 500e is or any of these sort of electric quote-unquote shit boxes um, because they can give their all in silence and the difference between that and a hybrid or any slow gas-powered car is you don't have to listen to mooing of some terrible four-cylinder. I, I don't um, find even that the e-golf is that slow. I mean, like, I know objectively it's not that fast, but in the real world, it, it, it doesn't leave me wanting. Like, it's faster in an urban environment than, you know... I mean, I, I continually... 250 hear, horsepower car. Right, but I can't continually hear journalists bitch about, like, oh, my God, that Corolla is so slow, and that this is so slow, and whatever. And these, these are eight-and-a-half-second cars, and so is the e-golf. But yeah. an eight-and-a-half-second electric vehicle that is at full torque all the time ready to go versus a screaming cvt miserable four-cylinder shit box um look hey look at that corolla that we rented to on the road trip down to la to to buy that quadrifoglio i'd rather right. not look at it well okay bad bad looking okay listen to it is the more point i mean it just I'd rather not listen to it either I, I bet in a drag race it's no slower than your than your e-golf and yet the difference is the e-golf is quick and fun and sprightly and that corolla was miserably slow by your dis- definition yes um and so i just think are you right for as a everyday transportation device no one has any right driving in, in ICE or however you just phrased it because we've just found a better way and that's so. That's but then, where does that leave the the old cars? I mean, do they just get legislated out of existence? I've used this example before, but it's like there's plenty of steam engines that run around that people do like sort of enjoyable excursions in. Like, is there going to be a place that where vin- vintage cars, you know, vintage could mean GT fours, <laughs> came yeah. in GT fours. At some um, point, it will. <laughs> yeah, like, are they going to be saved? I guess this I is think- Haggerty's mission, right? This is what. You're trying to Agony's stated mission is to save save driving. And and frankly, it's the right way of looking at it because transportation, we have transportation needs. And I think that doesn't have to coincide perfectly with our need or our want for driving. Um, And the the two of them can exist. And frankly, the the quicker we get the the mass vehicles off of fuels and internal combustion, the, 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 the less we can pollute and the more gas that's left for us in the old cars. Um, As long as it's not made illegal. So as long as it's not made illegal, and it will be at some point, there will be restrictions, but I hope that they're still okay. But what all of this really reminds me of is doing this Renault R5 research. I'm just reading a ton of car magazines from the 1980s, like 80 through 84. And what, I mean, we talk about the malaise era all the time. But when you really read these articles, it was like, I, I wish all of these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor drugs like Prozac had been invented at this time because it's the most depressing shit you've ever read. I mean, everything got slower and slower and slower. And they're all like, 
you know, this new wave of compacts and, you know, they're, they're, the, the big three were the, the American car manufacturers were trying desperately to compete with the, the sort of compact Japanese stuff. And I mean, I just read Car and Driver's initial early coverage of the, this Cadillac Cimarron. <laughs> I mean, we forget the fucking thing. At Why did you read horsepower. that? Because it was in the same article. Look, it was in the same uh, issue Magazine. as the Renault R5. And I read the whole thing cover to cover. But it was just this one sad stuff. I mean, there were violins playing the entire time. Here's a Cadillac with a four-cylinder. And then there, uh, then there were the other, the other article was uh, the road test of the Cadillac V864, which is the world's yes. first cylinder deactivation. And they were like, well, you know, right now Cadillacs... Um, I just introduced this like 1980. Had just introduced their first 4.3 liter V6, and they were like, by the year 1985, they predicted less than five percent of Cadillac's sales would be V8s, and they're looking at this wow. like six liter V8 with cylinder deactivation that still got 13 miles per gallon. Like it delivered no fucking benefit to anyone in the real world. Um, and they're looking at that, and then they're going, oh my God, look at this four cylinder that's coming in the Cimarron that was a two liter carbureted two valve push rod overhead valve like just genuinely it's a tractor motor tra tragedy of a tractor motor and they're going that's going to go on the big cars and it's it's fucking 12.9 or 13.6 seconds to 60 in the little car and what are we going to do it was just a horrible horrible time and i look now at the difference between then and now and where we're like hey electric cars we can go 0 to 60 in 2.3 seconds and get 130 miles per gallon equivalent in a tesla yeah. So it really doesn't suck that bad. Like this is not as bad as we think it is right now. It's nothing like it was in 1975 to 1985. Yeah, I mean the early before the, the three. The, I mean, and I think this is underrepresented in most enthusiast minds. But the thing that saved all of this. I mean, because now you know you can get a six and a half liter V12 that makes 700 horsepower at 9,000 RPM or whatever, uh, and. Uh, that passes all the emission standards that they were struggling to, you know, that turned these 400 horsepower V8s into, you know, 150 horsepower just because of the emissions equipment. Right. And the way we got there is ex almost exclusive. Well, it's two things. It's really the, it's, well, it's, it's one thing that is two things. The <laughs> catalytic converter combined with um, electronic engine controls. Yeah. Yeah. If you put those two things together, then you are able to have an emissions meeting, you know, six and a half liter naturally aspirated V12 with 700 horsepower that revs to 9,000 RPM. The other thing is legislation wise, I mean, we, the, the U.S., the EPA came in with a sledgehammer in, initially and said, you got to put catalytic converters on these cars. And, and, you know, the car companies fought and fought and fought and fought. And there's that brilliant story about Honda saying, you know, like, no problem. We can meet the, the emission standards without even that catalytic converter with the yes. CDCC engine and all this other stuff. But and the, then the other GM thing, was like, we'll have that too, please. We'll have it too, please. Um, and then Ford was buying motors for it. And then there's like that story. That's, a, that's its own episode. But what, what ultimately happened was we came in with a hammer and then never got any stricter. The fuel economy standards that came along along with the emissions, the EPA emission standards, never got any stricter. So mm -hmm. over the last 40 years, we've en been able to engineer cars to be faster and, and heavier and better in every single way, objectively, scientifically, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, and no one, and, and the, the fuel economy regs not only haven't kept pace with that, but also the exempt the SUV exemption um, has oh, really hurt our, fuel, our corporate fuel economy. And it, look, yeah. So to be clear, I'd like some for some context, the, the the couple of exemptions that existed, one was for for trucks and SUVs and and not affecting cafe. So cafe is corporate average fuel economy, which was a requirement that all of the product mix of the entire company's like vehicles sold had to meet some certain requirement. And I think actually, I mean, let's give some credit here to Mercedes Benz because. Uh, starting in like I think it's 78, 79, they almost they switch almost the entire model line to diesels because diesels are exempt from meeting emission standards uh, and Perfect. they can still provide some level of performance that when you have 80 horsepower on a Cadillac, the 120 horsepower in a diesel Mercedes, you know, 300D or SD. Uh, is a rocket, and so if anyone is interested, I, th I think it's very interesting to go back and watch the. Um, if you watch John Davis doing his uh, Motor Week We're review, glad to have you with us. Uh, hello and welcome. Is he the hello and welcome guy? Uh, uh, I think is that the AOL. Welcome. 
You no, 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 there's a hello me. and welcome guy. Uh, anyway, uh, so watch the, the period review of the 300 SD because this is a full-size Mercedes S-Class that, I don't know what it weighs, 4,000 pounds maybe, and it has 115 or 120 horsepower diesel. And he's just glowing about how wonderful the performance of this thing is, even though it's like a boat by modern standards. But that was mm. how bad things were, such that 113 horsepower uh, uh, Mercedes S-Class was better than, uh, for example, a Cadillac Cimarron with 80 horsepower, or, you know, Oldsmobile made, uh, or GM generally made an attempt to do V8 diesels. Um, just don't they <laughs> are just some of the absolute worst diesels on earth. Uh, I mean, were, because it was basically- because they're all gone. They exploded yes. immediately. Yeah. Yes, because they were gas engines that were converted to diesels, but, you know, spoiler alert, co- diesels have a compression ratio of like 22 to one and gas engines are like eight to one. And so they just like, the heads just flew off basically. Um, um, that was a good sound. And uh, so th- those, v- those GM V8 diesels, there's actually, a, a, did I make you watch this video on YouTube? There's a guy who has five of these uh, GM diesels still running wow. and there's just all the cars are lined up and they're all, the hoods are open and they're all idling simultaneously. But they put these things in like the, the 88s and the Royales and Buicks and shit like that. It was a 350. So, it was a 5.7 liter V8 just converted uh, poorly to run on a diesel. Very, very but, bad. Look, so, it's funny. It's funny that you say, let's give Mercedes credit. I mean, because... They didn't well, have a choice. Like, this was the joke. Is they, they identified that the only way they would ever be able to hit CAFE targets, the, the uh, 1977 through uh, 80, whatever it was, initial CAFE targets, was, to do, was a two-fold strategy. Number one, immediately put a diesel engine in every car they made. Except the SL. Um, well, fair enough. Um, and then number two, invest heavily in a new subcompact car and a new family of four-cylinder engines. And that was the w Called the 190E. 190E, yeah. But also the also the um, the 300e that was sold in the U.S. that you know which is the the, the E class the sort of larger version the W124 larger version of the 201 was still vastly more efficient than the 123 it replaced. So all of a sudden there was this huge focus on efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. Aerodynamics. Um, aerodynamics. That's why and that car was aero and Audi. Lo- look about this way: a 1985 Mercedes 190e 2.316 has a coefficient of drag of 0.32. The current CLA 45 AMG has a coefficient of drag of 0.32. So while we can look at this 10-year period of absolute misery where Corvettes had four and a half horsepower and did zero to 60 in two minutes, um, it, it forced the automakers through a painful pers- but process necessary. That, that resulted in the 124 and 201, i.e. the best engineered cars of all time. Not to mention really all of that. the other shit that we've had since then that has been so wonderful and that, still meets standards. That's benefit, all of that benefit, I mean, not all of it, but so much of it benefits from that, those two Mercedes models, right? And, but also um, the, all of the changes that needed to be made to, to the internal combustion engine. Um, and frankly, if you look at the air quality in cities like Los Angeles that was wretched in the 1980s um, and is now... And pretty, 70s and even and, 60s. Yeah, you're right. But overnight, by the time, I mean, the, the real change was the Sulev cars, the super ultra low emissions vehicle cars um, that were polluting, that were emitting cleaner air than they were taking in in most cities. And actually, I think Ulev cars were the same way already. Um, and the difference in LA's air quality between, it's, we're not talking that long ago. In, in the year 2000, it was smog most of the time. Um, and 10, 20 years later, it's gone. Um, mm-hmm. So we've made huge, huge progress in this, but it, unfortunately, we should have been ratcheting up these regulations, uh, and we should have probably adapted the U.S. safety mileage and emissions regulations to actually to keep SUVs on the same footing as passenger cars, because ultimately they're used as passenger cars. We didn't, um, and unfortunately, we had now have a fleet that barely uses any less gas than it did 40 years ago. Okay, the cars are much faster and much better and all this other stuff, but had we ratcheted up, maybe we wouldn't be, need to be in the position where California needs to say, okay, we're done. No more burning I mean, gas. I think the, the SUV exemption was really like a, just a really big sh- self-shooting in the foot. I mean, like people say that consumer preferences towards, uh, are towards SUVs. Bullshit. It's yeah, it's that manufacturer preferences, and so they only made compelling SUVs, and so right. then everyone's like, well, we got to buy an SUV because there's no alternative. You know, this is Look, like- there, there are parts about SUVs that people like, but there's two factors. Number one, you just said that, and number two, gas is cheap in the U.S., right? So no one gave a shit. No one, still no one. Consumers lie. For five minutes in a study, they'll say that fuel economy is 
um, you know, is a serious purchase consideration. But they only say that the, you know, the day before payday. The day once I get paid, they don't care. And if that weren't the case, we would, the, you know, the F-150 wouldn't, be, wouldn't outsell Camry two to one as the best-selling car in the U.S. And now, by the way, RAV4 outsells Camry. Um, and, you know, RAV4 is a Corolla. Let's think about this. Like, let's talk about how car companies have made SUVs be more appealing. You can have a Corolla sedan or you can have a RAV4. Now, assuming you had those two, cho- those two cars to choose from, which are you going to choose? Uh, the RAV4. Damn right. It's got a, a far bigger engine. It's got more power. It's got more room. It's, got, it's, better, it's better looking. It's less it's frumpy looking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just more appealing. Um, and that's what's happened across the board, starting with, you know, Range Rover early on. But really, Explorer and Grand Cherokee are the two that just turned the SUV from this weird a sort of thing. like truckish thing that you bought if you were willing to put up with like a reasonable risk of death from overturning while driving into well, like let's a not talk about the the explorers non reasonable <laughs> risk, risk of, of overturning yes, risk of overturning <laughs> but yeah those that's why everything's unitary because they're yeah. unitary chassis because people want it to drive like a car because they want a car but they yes. want you know, they want all the things that an SUV... Look, Americans hate hatchbacks. I love that product planners still believe this. Really? Because last time I checked, three quarters of the cars sold in America have a hatchback. They're also... We don't need... Geographically, we don't need the little tiny hatchbacks that Europe has. So you bring, like, Saturn Astra. Remember that thing that was on sale for here for two seconds? Um, oh, yes. Yeah. That's the one where you're like, am I in Europe? Whenever you yeah, see one. Exactly. Because it's an Opel Astra with Saturn badges on it. That doesn't work here because you don't need a $30,000 premium small car anywhere outside of San Francisco and Boston. I think that's kind of it. You need that in Europe, which is why Golf sells so many. It's a premium, expensive, well-built, but small car. We don't really go put a, go put a Saturn Astra in the middle of, uh, of an interstate in Iowa and see how well that works. Or... Get an F-150 in the same place, and I guarantee you're going to be driving the F-150. And so there, there are so many reasons, but at the end of the day, we exempted SUVs um, as, quote, off-road vehicles, which meant they were exempt from safety standards for a long time. They still are. Most car companies will, will perform the same crash tests and safety sort of engineering on the SUVs just because they feel like they need to. The, government's, the government still basically exempts all of them. Um, and... You wind up with this class of vehicles that are using more fuel than ever, and of course, we just it went too far. It went too far. Look at the fires, look at the floods, look at, the, look at climate change. And for those people who don't believe in climate change who are watching this, I am not telling you that we have changed climate with cars. You can believe what you want. I am, however, a believer that things are changing, and it, there's at least a very good possibility that we have had something to do with it. So let's just eliminate that. Let's just stop doing that and see what changes. That's kind of my attitude on there. I think it's too late. No matter. Great. Thanks um, for that vote of optimism. I, don't... I mean, there's like a lot of science out there that, uh, I don't know. Does science work for these people? I don't know. I don't know how to talk to these people. <laughs> uh, fundamentally, I agree with you. I'm going to be less hedgy than you and just say that like humans have caused climate change and that there's things like we are obliged to to make meaningful behavior changes in order to eliminate that. I think travel by jet is this like sort of really luxurious thing that is really also ir- irresponsible. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's, then there's a lot of stuff related to that. And it's like, of course, where does this electricity come from also is a really important question yeah. to ask because if it comes from burning coal, obviously that's not ideal. Uh, and so the goal is to create an infrastructure that is generating the electricity in a way that's not uh, having these environmental impacts. Yeah. Um, in any case, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to be as conditional about it as Jason, and I'm going to say like flat, flat out that nice. humans. Oh well, I'm not. <laughs> Good. Uh, so, I mean, to the extent that the, the, I mean, you can also draw this and say like, wh- why do humans exist in an environment where that necessitates us to travel so much? Like, why not live where you work? There's this whole fetishization of suburbia, which happened after World War II because everybody wanted a piece of land and a picket fence and lots of space and a yard and stuff. And all of that is, is good stuff. But what we did is we institutionalized a system where it, it necessitated people to cover 30 miles a day minimum 
just to do their basic functions. And it's like, well, why do we have a system that requires that? Coupled with a lack of like an alternative other than driving yourself around. Uh, soapbox, blah, blah, blah. Like, okay, we're supposed to be talking about cars. The point is that... <laughs> Like most people don't like to have to do that. Like it's an it's a burden, and we are a small group where we actually like the car part of it. And then mm -hmm. it's like, why don't we have the? I mean, our ideal world is a world in which the roads that are fun to drive on are empty and occupied solely by people who are getting value out of them. And I feel the same way about consuming fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I think we, it's my hope that we get there. Right? It's my hope that that we can make changes to do what we need to do as a society, but still allow. Vintage cars still allow something that's the experience, right? Um, I sure hope so. And if it needs to, as far as I'm concerned, if it needs to be that the the sale of internal combustion engine cars and oh, and by the way, 2035 feels like a long way away. In some ways, it's tomorrow, and in some ways, it, it is a long way away. But this is California hasn't done this in a vacuum. Like other countries, like Germany is five years ahead of that. It's 2030. Yeah, and the um, UK is also in 2035. Right. So it's it, one way or another, it's not like California's in a vacuum. I think the rest of the U.S. is probably looking at California going, you guys are out of your fucking mind. But the reality is cars are a global product. Um, and in the rest of the world, they are going to start to become outlawed. So the car companies do not have another choice. Um, and so California's following suit, and I think smartly so. Where California goes, the rest of the U.S. goes typically. Um, uh, yeah, that but, has certainly been true. I mean, like in the... Starting in the 60s, when the first emissions regulations appeared, I think 67 or 68, it was the same thing. And you, you like look at some old cars and you see here's the California version of this car and here's the 49 state version of this car. So California has a long history of doing this and people, of course, call it the sort of communist nation or whatever. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that like, in terms of air quality and like it's a, it, there are measurable benefits that are achieved, even if it's uh, problematic for us as enthusiasts. I mean, I will say that the regulations around smog, around old cars, I find to be really objectionable uh, because, I mean, I, the way that I rationalize this is that old cars represent such a small segment of, of car miles covered in a year. And to have these sort of onerous regulations around smog for old cars to me is just like, I get it because you're trying to get sort of ill-maintained, you know, 89 Tauruses off the road. Uh, but those cars kind of die on their own anyway, and consumers like to keep sort of newer cars anyway. And so then the people who it primarily impacts are people who, you know, like you and me, who would be t putting 2,000 miles a year, if that, on some exactly. car with carburetors. Uh, and so, you know, maybe selfishly, I find yeah. that really objectionable. I, I find it too uh, objectionable also. And so, you know, while I sit here and defend the state of California, I will also say that living in California with classic cars is a fucking nightmare. Um, because at, if they're newer know, than 76, if yeah, they're newer than 76 75. Newer. Um, and you know, in other States that I've lived, the, the emissions standards were relaxed over time. So, you know, your car could start to pollute a little bit more or like, you know, I lived in Florida years ago. They just got rid of all the emissions testing because they once, once OBD2 happened, they realized everything was just passing anyway. So they'd got rid of their, their emissions testing facilities. Um, and other states are sort of starting to get rid of them. California is now thinking about getting rid of the dynos that they put on the cars, the cars on for emissions tests. But the reality is, every two years, they're coming for you. Um, and it's, God, it sounded like Kamala there. They're coming, I have to look directly in the camera. They're coming for you. Um, but it is really that every two years, I get my, a knot in my stomach when I get a smog notification for one of the cars because I, not only are the standards not relaxed, in some cases they're getting stricter and harder to pass. Yes. So I um, noticed this with my 911 because my old 911 passed smog. And then the, I went back two years later and it didn't pass. And I was like, is my car really in that worse state? And then I looked at the limits and the limits had actually gone down. Right. Like Which they're is, actually trying to force the cars off the road. Is what and then you get the, the letter in the mail that we get, I get every, every two years. <laughs> we'll give you $500 for your air-cooled 911. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Yeah, the, the state I'm on board. literally offers us a you know a thousand dollars, and this is what, when I find it particularly offensive is when it's like your car with a license plate, historical vehicle, whatever, blah 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 blah, is polluting a lot. Would you like to? We'll give you a thousand bucks for it, and I get really pissed off. Like, give me an exemption for that car. Putting historical plates on that car has already exempted me from using it as daily daily transportation. It is for use for the purpose of preserving and celebrating that car. 
leave me alone with the 800 miles a year I put on the car in, you know, in three road trips. It is not yep. a real factor. And that's, we come to the same conclusion. Like this is, these are not really actually emitting that much. Start the Ferrari, birds fall out of the sky dead. I get that. Like it's, it's terrible for the environment, but as a, as a proportion of the total pollution, um, it's zero. And to offset that, I have 100% green energy that is delivered to my house. It's an option that we have with PG&E, our electrical supplier, and I pay a little bit more to buy carbon credits that, that guarantee that any electricity I'm used is zero carbon. I think that's the right thing to do. <laughs> I probably should buy a little bit more of that to uh, offset. I think what you can do that. Time. There's places yeah. where you can do that. <laughs> right. But, the rea- but, but come on, how much damage could I possibly be doing you know, in, with a total of a couple thousand miles a year in the old cars? Yeah, I don't know. And then uh, who, you, you know, talk about the uh, cost of, uh, to the economy as a whole of sort of enforcing all of that. Because right. you were saying the dynos, when they started doing the dynos and it was like all the smog stations had to buy these dynos. I mean, how much does a dynamometer cost? Thousands. I would, Thousands yeah. And like if everyone has to do that, I, I, I don't know. Even the, even the regular emissions testing machine that they have in California are, you know, 10,000 plus. But, but the, we're not all that different from other countries. I mean, you know, I kind of wish we had German TÜV, which is their, you know... Yes, I would rather have that than emissions testing. Because that's... That, well, Germany has emissions testing too. But I think, and someone in the comments is definitely going to correct me on this, I think um, the H plates, which are the historical vehicle plates, are exempt from that. And they're, you know, the H plates are only g- good for, for the summer season and temporary, and they do exempt you from certain things. Um, and I think it might be emissions. I just also. wish that in California they would put as much effort into the safety of the vehicles on the road, like tire condition and suspension yeah. ball joints and like functional lights and stuff like that, uh, that they would into emissions testing. Because you, I mean, in so many times, and I'm sure this is true all over the United States, where you see a car and you're just like, that car has no business being on the road. Like it is oh. literally a, a rolling death trap risk to society. And here it is out there and it's fine. I mean, you go, you go to places like Michigan or, you know, where they use a lot of salt in the winter. And they have yes, winter. and like the car is a Flintstone car. Right. How, and this is, this is legal for use, and yet we're restricted from a car that now can p- produce one quarter as much emissions as it was legally allowed to produce when it was new. Um, there's a mismatch there, right? We're not focusing on the, on the right thing. Um, but all of the, I think, but at the end of the day, I think all of it's necessary. Like, I'm hoping that I'm... My cars have historical vehicle plates because I'm hedging. I'm thinking at some point they're going to be restricted. And I'm hoping that historical plated vehicles are exempt from that because I think it is important for us to never throw those cars away and say they were never part of our history. They're never part of, you know, our, of our fun. Um, but I really, I think everyone should go back and start reading car magazines from the 1980s to see how bad that was. Because that I mean, was... Even all, it, it was, they had also been at it for 10 or 15 years at that point. And so I think that that is also reflected in their demoralizing. I mean, you look at, just compare the spec of a 67 Corvette with like a 72 Corvette and it's the same engine and the power is less than half for yeah. the big block. I mean, and then they just stopped making them. It's just, they, yeah. there was this situation where they had a, a legal, a social uh, system in place without the technology to meet it. And they said, the technology will find a way. And it did. It did. And it took, you know, 10 years to happen, but it was a very uncomfortable 10 years and it required a lot of thinking that I think the big three were not really inclined or interested to do that, you know, it was just w- where you get the inroads from the Japanese. And I think that permanently changed the landscape of uh, the automotive industry in the United States. Okay, counterpoint. We're at the same spot again. The technology for electric cars is not there, um, but it's not Japan. It's not Japan who's at the forefront of it this time. It's America. I mean, we have but a all, very specific have, part of America. It's, it's not Silicon in Valley, Detroit. Right? It's yeah, not. It's, it's, it's definitely not in Detroit. Rivian is in somewhere in the Midwest, but yeah, we have Rivian. I mean, obviously Tesla goes without saying, and then we have, we have Rivian, which is a company I'm exceptionally excited about. Um, uh, and then we have Lucid. And then we have all of these other startups that are doing what the, what the big three uh, and all of the, con- all of, not just the big three, all of the conventional automakers said wasn't possible. They all said you can't have an electric fuel. This Tesla will never sell. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. This what They are just so mired in their excuses of traditional thinking that they're, that they're watching everyone pass them by. 
Um, but they don't realize that they're not, that the other people are going past them. They think that they're on a different trajectory that doesn't affect them. Some of them do, some don't. I think they're the, starting I think to, well, I mean, compared right. to 10 years ago. Right. 10 years ago, they certainly didn't think that. Oh, I think they now, still, even four or five years ago, right before Dieselgate, the you know, engineers at Porsche and Volkswagen were still laughing at Tesla, laughing at them. Um, and now they're like, uh oh. Um, you know, and they're all rushing to market. But I, I sat in an ID4, I didn't drive it yet. But um, they missed the mark. Taycan really missed the mark. Um, certainly the first round of electric cars from Germany missed the mark. You know, the e-tron, that Audi e-tron thing that's 5,800 pounds and goes 10 feet and needs, needs to be plugged in. Um, they're, they're missing the mark because they're really thinking in, tr- in traditional terms. And the joke is that all of these car companies have people embedded in Silicon Valley and all they do is pull their hair out, scream at Germany. You know, the Germans, this is not possible. Well, it's not possible what's happening here, right? Like, here's a screenshot of what I saw in my work this morning, and it's like a sea of Teslas um, with an occasional e-golf and leaf. And they're like, yeah, but no one buys these cars. And like, oh, who's on the road? Yeah, that's stupid. It's stupid in Silicon Valley. And now they're finally seeing in Europe, you know, in, in main, mainland Europe, I guess. Um, the mothership. That, 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 they're, that things are changing, and they're going to have to do it. And the only... It's scary, and I don't want to lose that experience that I had in 718 uh, Spider Man. Like, really upsetting to realize. Like, I genuinely teared up when I realized, like, this is gone. This is over. We got, we got 15 <sighs> more years, and Porsche will never be able to sell another internal combustion engine. Like, if that really happens, that really messed with my head. Um, but I don't think we're going to wind up in another Malaise era. I think we're going to wind up in a, No, because a, the, the alternative range. is so much more compelling. For daily transportation, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's a comp- there's a there's a there's a an experience that you have when you drive the the subsequent iteration of the technology, where you're like, wow, this is actually good. Yeah. Like, what a time to be alive, especially compared <laughs> to the Malays era. Right. Yeah, I think we're we have exciting times th- coming up. I think that your reaction w- is different from mine because I guess I'm fundamentally an old car guy anyway and so it doesn't meaningfully change my sort of purchasing or like vehicular preference patterns because uh i would still be buying old shit the same old shit anyway will it will it change your life and directly impact you when there are no 10 year old cars for you to buy when they're when they stop genuinely ask that question because they'll stop right after 20 35 you're not going to be able to buy a new car so 2033 model here might be the last possible car that you would ever be able to consider and what happens when they're 30 years old maybe you don't first of all here's the thing let me let's be honest about one thing right away modern cars largely suck they are better than ever objectively as transportation devices but are getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse to drive and the reason that i was all emotional about that 718 spider is because i didn't think a car like that was possible in today's world everything is so fucking bad Sorry to sound like Debbie Downer, um, that this, this car is a bright spot. Could I drive it next to a, uh, like a 987 Spider? Would it be better? I don't know. I haven't driven a, 70, a 987 Spider in a couple of years. But, um, but the reality is it's all going this way, so I don't know if you're really going to ever want a 2029 20, BMW M4 manual. Yeah, uh, that's kind of the point that I was trying to make. I mean, how many 10-year-old cars am I buying generally? It's not because like I'm particularly keen about the driving experience because if you give me the choice between... I don't know, a 10-year-old Porsche and a 30-year-old Porsche, I'm going to choose the 30-year-old Porsche. And so there's like a particular era for me where it's like, this is the sweet spot. Like, I'm perfectly satisfied with this level of performance. You know, I 250 to 300 horsepower is plenty for me from, from a Porsche. And so mm-hmm. I, don't need to, I don't need a 997. Like, I, that doesn't, the incremental benefit there is not really that compelling. And, and like, you take the whole package into consideration and what I want to feel when I drive a car, and I'd still rather be driving a a late 80s Carrera. Uh, so I guess that's my reaction. When you say, like, if there's not going to be 10-year-old cars for me to buy, I don't think I'm going to care that much. To, like, to be honest for, with you, I, yeah, I don't think you, I think you're right because they're not all that good. Yeah, there's like a handful of them out there and then, like, I will buy those if, like, for whatever reason, if it, if it strikes my fancy. But generally speaking, the, the sweet spot for me is kind of like 1950 and, 1980 with some occasional excursions into the 80s and there, and there are plenty of 90s and, and 2000s cars that are really great genuinely great to drive yeah um, but they I think just don't resonate with me personally right. in the same way yet they might 
They might. Yeah, I don't know. As I, you I, become I, an even older curmudgeon, they might. Well, and as frankly, as modern cars get progressively less exciting and more insular than, than even a car that I previously thought was too modern and dull, it will seem exciting by comparison. Yeah, that's the, that's the good thing is what, about being on a bad trajectory. <laughs> as as everything gets worse, the old stuff seems better. And that's... Yeah. I mean, that's where we are with BMW. I mean, you know, we all criticize BMW right now, but the stuff from 10 years ago that I was like, oh, this is horrible. Well, the like new the stuff E90? is so much worse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, E90 was always ugly, so that was, it drove well at least, um, but I never thought it was a particularly pretty car. Um, I'd ra- rather look at an E90 than an E60. Yeah. yeah. But, to, but to daily drive, give me my electric car, and then, and then that allows me to, for transportation. And once, once EVs have genuine, unkillable batteries and great range, um, and we'll, we're going to get there. We're there. I mean, we're getting getting there. Um, once that happens, that allows the terrible old cars that you and I love, that are thing, things that are terrible at being transportation devices, but amazing at putting a smile on your face, um, to be the winners. And I'm fine with that. Mm. But it ain't, it, this ain't 1984 again. Thank I'd be God. very curious to come and rewatch this in 10 years and see how, we're, how we do. Well, we got 15 until the, the last internal combustion. But I think we're just going to continue to be on this descent, right? I mean, you know, it's not like nothing will happen until 2035. The, the CO2 regs in Europe are just getting stricter and stricter, and the noise regs are getting stricter and stricter, and the particulate emissions are getting stricter and stricter. So, like, we're just, we're, they're throttling, they're basically strangling the internal combustion engine, knowing that it will be over in 2030 or 2035. Um, but it's not like they're leaving it alone until then. And we're going to have 9,000 RPM screaming V12s until that day. Not happening. I mean, Ferrari's going to be putting hybrid V6s in all their cars coming soon. Um, and it's just the way it is. That's, that's the, the reality of the descent we're on. Okay, everybody go buy the cheapest V12 you can find. Don't tell them that. Don't just drive up the price. Shut up. Um, yeah, but I think I'm, I'm going to... Maybe I'll try to post something uh, and it's like an Instagram like with links to old some of these. If I can find some of these old uh, road tests where just we realize just how good we have it right now. I think that Car and Driver still publishes their stuff online. I think it was Car and Driver. There was some magazine where I was doing research for something else and I, I discovered that they had really good product support or whatever for the old magazines where you could just read the old articles, which I thought was cool. Yeah. I mean, some of them do, like a car driver does archived road tests or archived, um, and they do stuff like that, but I had not read the Cimarron coverage, cover, you know, cover to cover. Um, just how you remiss know. of you. <laughs> I'm just a terrible I, I, I enthusiast. Because I didn't for not own that re- magazine. I didn't own it. I just went last week through and I organized all my 80s and 90s car drivers in boxes and made it right. And I had to order, as research for this Renault R5 video, I had to order a bunch of eBay magazines. Um, and once I get them, I read them cover to cover. But wow, was 1981 a bad time to be a car enthusiast. Almost yeah, and that's why as stuff as like the BMW 533, which had like 180 horsepower and f- good balance and inline six was just like, holy yeah. crap. Yeah. And like the 911 SC, the same thing. Like, cause if you look back on them now, you're like, oh, it's only got 180 horsepower. But like that was transcendent, the good shit yeah. back then that's compared the to yeah. what the mainstream I mean, stuff was. You gotta remember the, the best case scenario for any of these cars was that they didn't get slower. So yeah. like the Ferrari 308 didn't get faster. It got slower from 75 to 77. Yes, when they bottom. added fuel injection. And then never got, they did, they went bigger in displacement. They did, oh, even, what was it, another car that we did, we did some, oh, the BB cars, the, mm-hmm. the Ferrari Testarossa. So starting out with a 365 and then a 512 BB and then a Testarossa and the 512 TR, 512M, never got any faster. Uh, never got any faster. The TR did, the 512 TR did. Not according to the road test. It had the same quarter mile. They all had the same quarter mile. Hmm. Um, it, they just kept adding weight for crash and weighting everything. And I think that whole period is defined where the best possible case was you just didn't get any slower. Like if the I car think they started get... getting out of that in the late 80s. Like you think about, uh, like Porsche certainly did that. It went to twin plug ignition. Uh, Ferrari, you finally get to 300 horsepower in, in the 348. Like they started finally, get, and it was really right. the Bosch Metronic system, that the computer-controlled fuel injection that really allowed right. them to start actually getting performance back instead of just focusing on emissions. Because there's always the trade-off between emissions and power. And when initially it was just like emissions, 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 because there was the focus. And then once they, they could start getting back performance finally, 
yeah. in the, the 90s, early 90s, late 80s. All right. We are at 59 minutes and something, and I'm going to go back to going on vacation. No, you're not. You're going to keep no, working. I'm going to keep working. But you're not right. going to be working while you're doing the camaraderie show. I'm not. So you're going to do different work. I'm going to do not, f- work that does not require me to be in front of a camera. And talking to me. Yes. yes. Noted. All it's right. Not, it's not really about you. I mean, okay. I, I'd mind I, I was giving you an opportunity, a, a sort of softball to insult me, and you didn't take it. What, now, why would I possibly insult you? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.